Hi again, Dr. Sean Allen here with the Gate Guys. Welcome back to our video series um, again. And um, today, today we're going to talk about uh, the Brannock device. This is something you've probably seen in your um, in many shoe stores, but um, and occasionally you get to see it used. But um, unfortunately, it's not being used as much as it used to because the templating of all different shoe companies is not what it used to be. Um, no longer will you get a, uh, a size 7 in a Rockport being a size 7 in a Nike being a size 7 in a Reebok. Um, all of these shoe companies have fairly close uh, um, templating for shoe sizes, but they're not all the same. And so when you get a measurement off of here, you can take this measurement, but it may ha mean that you have to bump up into a slightly different measurement or bump down in, in a different shoe. So there is some value in this product, though, and it's, a lot of it is on understanding uh, your patient's foot and also rendering information to your client. Um, this thing measures uh, several things. It measures a heel to ball length. It measures a heel to toe length, meaning the whole length of the, of the foot. So heel to toe would be the full length of your foot. The heel to ball would be from the heel to the ball of the first metatarsal phalangeal joint or the MPJ joint for short. Okay, so this essentially measures your arch length. So the first one measures your arch, arch length, that's heel to ball, and then your full foot length or your sole length is heel to toe. There's also a width measurement, and there's something on here that also allows the width measurement. That's the width bar on the side, okay. So understanding how this can be used can certainly help you uh, uh, decide if your patient has a, a slight variance in, in, in a foot or maybe a side to side variance because um, although a lot of shoe companies and most shoe companies aren't willing to sell two different shoe sizes, some of them are, but um, you can also mitigate some of that by changing the, uh, the amount of stock bulk that you have in the shoe or by adding um, some extra foam in the shoe or an extra insert or something like that that might actually eat up some of the difference in the uh, shorter sized uh, foot uh, in that shoe. So. Um, so it just gives you more information, and information is very valuable, especially in this day and age. The more information you have, the better decisions that you can make. I want to take a, a, just an example for a moment, and here's a perfect scenario, uh, at least conceptually. Imagine that you have two people come in, and they've got, both have a size 8 foot. Okay? You can have one person with a size 8 foot um, who has a ball length, that is different than the other person. Although they both measure a full heel to toe length the same. They're both eights heel to toe. But heel to ball they're different. Meaning one person can have a shorter arch length and longer toes and still come out at an eight. And the other person can have um, a longer a heel to ball length and shorter toes but still come out at an eight. Um, the brilliance of this is that both of these people will be fit into the same size shoe Theoretically, if you measure heel to heel to toe, which would be basically a lot of shoe stores and a lot of people measure there, is the shoe satisfactor, satisfactorily long by just grabbing here, making sure there's enough room. But the brilliance of understanding that two people can have the same size foot but have a different arch length. Uh, again, arch length is the heel to ball me measurement. Uh, the brilliance of this is that <clears throat> you want the shoe to bend where the foot bends. And if you know where the person's arch length or where that first metatarsal uh, phalangeal joint, i.e. The ball, the ball joint here at that first metatarsal, if you know where that ends, then you really know what size shoe you should be in. In other words, all shoes have a, um, a breaking point. And you can see that this shoe has a definitive breaking point right about here. And you can see that it tends to bend there more than anything else. Well, you can see that this shoe company also has put a a very conveniently uh, located siping in the shoe um, where there is less tread so that it bends very easily there. And there's another point here and then there's another point here. And you can see that the shoes bend more easily at those points. This first one is very important because that is where, and uh, I don't have a pen, usually I'll take a pen. This is a pencil though, so it's not going to mark, but I'll take a pen, pen or pencil and I will measure on the side of the shoe or put an indication on the side of the shoe where the ball length is so we know where that shoe bends. And then we'll put the client's foot in there and then I'll try and palpate the metatarsal phalangeal joint and then I'll have it mark it on the shoe and then I'll have them bend and I'll, I'll like to see that the shoe in that point, or in that point at the toe, bend at relatively the same place. If they do, then I know I've got a pretty good measurement. OK, 
okay? So you want those two to bend at the same point. Because the foot bends before the shoe does, because the foot's going to start to move up, there's a relative difference there, but you want um, those two points to be pretty clear. You need to under, or pretty close, but you need to also understand that the foot can migrate in the shoe a little bit. Some people say, a, you know, a quarter of an inch. Some people say more. Certainly that depends on how tightly they um, tie up their shoes. But um, you have to remember that uh, when you go to get your shoes fit, when you just stand them in the store, or worse yet, just sit in them, that shoe size and your, and your, your foot size is going to is not going to give you a full reading in the shoe because walking is going to be um, uh, an increase in your body mass acceleration, all of these issues. So, um, but running is going to double that. You know, some people say that your body weight is uh, three times more than it actually is in walking and it's six more in running. It depends what uh, uh, source you look at for that. But, um, you know, those aren't bad numbers to look at. The bottom line is that when you load the foot when you're walking, the foot does go through pronation and supination cycles where the arch changes. In running, that cycle can change faster, and it may be even a little bit more since you have to dampen more force load. There may be more pronation to dampen that. So the bottom line is that when you get the shoe on in the store, or when you take it home and just break it in a little bit and see if you did get the right size, make sure that you stand in it. Make sure that there is adequate length for that arch to move from that point. Uh, a shoe that has fit well will feel like it's um, almost broken in perfectly right from the get-go. You can imagine that if you were trying to bend the shoe through this point here, there's no bend in the shoe there, but it's very simple to bend it right at the siping points where they've created it in the shoe. You'll also notice that the siping points are, are, are typically on, a, on a, a parabola to meet the metatarsal heads. and It also tends to be the widest part of the foot. So you would like this siping point and the width of the shoe uh, and the person, person's foot orientation for the ball of the foot where the toes do bend at those metatarsal phalangeal joints, you'd like that to be at the widest part of the shoe and in the easiest bending part of the shoe. The Brannock device will give you that. Okay, So you've got a right and a left, you'll just spin it around. Um, you're supposed to stand on this. Most of these... Um, a lot of the stores that I've been in, they say um, to sit on, sit down and do this, but it actually says on here somewhere um, to stand, to stand down to get the width, which would make sense as you stand, the, the arch is going to splay and the width of the foot is going to splay. So you want to stand in this. So you put the heel here, you'd measure the length of the foot as it came in, okay? So you'd have your heel to toe length, okay? And then you'd slide this thing down to meet. And there's a little pointer here. And that pointer should be right where the joint of that first metatarsal phalangeal joint locks in, right there. Okay. So you're going to match that up, and that will give you another number. Okay. You want to take the longer. Uh, you want to take the longer of these two numbers because let's face it, if you've got a ball length that's seven, but you've got a heel to toe length that's eight, you need to be able to get your foot in the shoe. So ordering a size seven will be perfect for the ball, but the foot is going to be, the toes are going to be all cramped up in here. Okay, so um, always pick the longer of the heel to ball and heel to toe lengths. Okay, however, if you have a heel to ball length that, for example, is an eight and a half, but they've got a heel to toe that measures an eight, you would go with the eight and a half shoe. Okay, because that person has a longer arch and shorter toes. Again, you want the shoe to match as best as you can to, the, to where the, the ball bends, the first metatarsal phalangeal joint bends. And this a little sliding bar here will tell you that. So always take the larger of those two numbers, okay? And there may be two different sizes on our uh, PowerPoint presentation, and we'll see if we can put it into this um, um, uh, presentation here as well. We've got a picture of someone who has got a very large bunion on one side a hallux valgus, and we'll show you that that person, within one person, can have a different heel to toe and heel to ball length, okay? So we'll see if we can insert that in here. And then you'll have your width, and you'll just slide this, so you'll make sure that the foot is against the side marker, the heel to ball marker. You'll slide this, in, this width marker in, and you can get a measurement off of the side here, okay? Width seems to matter in a lot of people, but you have to understand the wider the forefoot, the wider the shoe you're going to need. And a lot of people, because we're seeing a lot more hallux valgus because the first metatarsal isn't stable, um, 
you will see a splaying a part of the metatarsal heads as that hallux moves over, okay? We've talked about this in some of our other work on the abductor and adductor hallucis muscles and how in the first metatarsal, uh, i.e. the first medial aspect of the tripod is unstable, when it's off of the ground, the hallux pulls towards the other origin insertion, and that's on some of our other work. Um, and you can go back into the archives on our blog to find that information. So stand down, you'll get the width of the shoe, or width of the foot, um, most shoes have sufficient width, particularly running shoes that have a lot of mesh top. They've got a lot of give to them. You always want to have enough width though. So if you're ever wondering um, what width to get, always go to the wider width because as you step down, you want the metatarsals to be able to spread apart as they naturally would. Okay, if they do not, and if they're not able to spread apart, what you're going to do is create a, uh, a cramping or a... Uh, crowding of the metatarsals, which will decrease some of the intrinsic musculature of the foot, the dorsal and plantar inner osseae. It's also going to change the way the foot can shock absorb because when we do step down on the arch and pronate, not only does the arch splay this way, but the transverse arch will splay apart a little bit as well. Okay, And that's just normal mechanics of the foot. So the last thing you want to do is do what a lot of hockey players do and soccer players, and they tend to get a nice tight shoe because they feel like they can cut more. I'm not um, saying that they can't do that, but what you're doing is you're, you're, in some respects, disabling some of the function of the foot in those devices when you get a, when you try to crowd your foot into a, a, a piece of footwear uh, that is too small for it. Okay, I know a lot of my cross country and track runners like to get into a smaller spike, but I'm trying to encourage them that um, really the only thing that matters in attaching the foot to the shoe is how well the lacing is. The rest of this, uh, the device is already on your foot if it's anchored through the top. It's not going to go anywhere. Some people just don't like the sloppiness if the, if the width is too wide, and that's when I encourage them to try a different a variety or brand of shoe because it's obviously just not perfect for them. Um, it's a little bit of personal preference when it comes to fit. You know, some people like a Toyota Camry and some people like a Honda Accord. Are they really that much different? Well, some people would say yes, but you know, in all aspects, they're really pretty close. So it's a matter of personal preference. So. So that's just a little bit of information on the Brannock device, uh, considering pronation and supination, heel to toe, heel to ball length, heel to toe length, width of the foot, and the use of the Brannock device to get that information, uh, and also to just use it to educate your client on the things that we just talked about. Um, shoe fit is very important, and it often starts with the knowledge of the shoe fitter and the understanding and the interactiveness of the person being fit. So, uh, thanks for your time. And uh, we'll see you guys again on our website, uh, thegateguys.com, or on our blog, thegateguys.tumblr.com. Thanks for your time watching our videos, and we'll see you guys again. Thanks a lot.